So thank you very much, uh, Professor Muller, for uh, inviting me to Bern. This is like my homecoming. I was trained here. And I think you had an excellent talk. Uh, Professor Pedro Ramirez, I think, should be a lawyer rather than a uh, <laughs> doctor, because he has presented his case only from one point of view, uh, very, very cleverly. Yes, very cleverly. I'm going to show you the same slides that he's going to show you, and I'm going to show you how he's just presented the positive side and not the actual one. Can I have this volume correct? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. So we'll stop for a moment. Can I get a chance to rebuttal? Yes. <laughs> Using law terms. <laughs> So before I start, I think, uh, let me tell you, me and Pedro go a long way as good friends, but not during the debates, I suppose. And I bring greetings from India. And I always say this, and this is my always a slide, that the eyes see only what it knows and doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. And that is the problem that we have. Tools have changed, but the windows have returned. And the biggest transformation of surgery has come to be the laparoscopic surgery. Now the truth about this LAC trial is that, well, it is a randomized trial, it is definitely proven, the trial was well designed, and there is nothing wrong about it. Uh, because we can see that both for laparoscopic and anti-robotic surgery, the, the survival is much less as compared to what we are seeing in open surgery in this case. So at that point, two large endometrial trials, LAP2 and LACE trials in Australia, suggesting that the minimal access surgery was absolutely safe in endometrial cancer and that was probably the basis of starting this for cervical cancers. And when you have such papers, you need to keep calm. Keep calm, not to get carried away with what is the truth because the ultimate truth has not yet come. Keep calm and focus on the basics. So I'm going to focus on the basics today. There are classifications, what is that? 2011, we changed the classification from fever to EORTC trial and we changed to cure lane. Is this the perfect classification? Everybody believes so. Because ureter was taken as a paradigm. And therefore, everybody said this is the best classification, the best objective classification, because it is the ureter which tells you how much amount of radicality you have achieved with C1, B1, and B2. And then, what was there is that the authors themselves felt, and I too felt, because in URTC, PUS, as well as in QLA called monoclassification, no classification tells you how much amount of parametrium should be removed, whether it should be removed, the lateral parametrium, the anterior parametrium. All of you know that anteriorly and posteriorly, the uterus and cancer does not invade into the cervical or cycle fascia, neither does it go into the renal villous fascia. So radical hysterectomy is all about the lateral, posterior, and anterior parameter. If you do not understand this, no matter what kind of radical you do, there is no way. So they decided that this should be modified, and this has now been modified with a 3D dimensional thing that they said that we should be recently published classification says that it is absolutely relevant to have a three-dimensional stage. Now, 2009, this trial starts based on which classification, I don't know. 2010 is the classification which accepted by everyone, purely moral. So we have no unification of classification, no unification what exactly was stage 2 and stage 3. What we need to identify is the anatomy. It's all about anatomy. You may have the numbers, you may have the various trials, but unless you understand the anatomy, what is the whole point of doing a radical spectrum? And this is the parametral evolution which I see. A perfect knowledge of anatomy is specifically required. All of you need to understand, and I repeat, that we cannot take out the parametrium anteriorly and posteriorly because the cervix is protected by the cervical or cycle fascia anteriorly and posteriorly by the denon villous fascia. It is this damn ureter which makes this cancer go into the parametrium because laterally, the cervical cycle fascia splits into two, which is the anterior cervical cycle ligament and the posterior cervical cycle ligament, and allows the pathology of the uterus to go outside. So you see, this is the staging, which is 2018. I think Pedro mentioned it that in 2018 there has been a change in the previous staging. 
But what he has not mentioned, or what all of you want to know, is 25% fallacy in the clinical staging in the best of the hands. Even Figo questions it, and therefore they have added radiology and they have added pathology. So you need to do an MRI, you need to do a pathology. What you do as a staging correctly is not the correct stage. So until now, Figo was stating that it should be based on clinical examination, but now this has changed and it has added imaging to this. So this is all about the parametrium. You can see that there is an anterior parametrium which is uh, the monitor. So this is the rectum, this is the uterus, this is the anterior parametrium and the posterior parametrium. And the reason I'm telling you all this is because when we come to actual arguments, I will show you. It is the non-clearance of the anterior parametrium to the fullest which has led to this kind of uh, study that we've got. And why does it happen in open? That also I will tell you. So parametrial spread in locally advanced cancer, you can see, is mainly in the posterior parametrium and also the lymph anterior parametrium. These are the radiological studies which have been done on various MRIs. How these patients in this trial did not have an MRI indicating whether these parametria were involved. So this is, as much as we know about the parametrium, we should be also knowing about the parasurvex. One cardinal rule of cancer is lymphatics follow the veins. Where do the veins go? The veins go into the lateral parametrium and the veins go into the anterior parametrium. The bladder does not have the veins directly draining into the inferior, into the internal iliac vein in females. While in males, you have the superior and the inferior vesical veins directly draining into the internal iliac vein. So you will see tomorrow when I do the live surgery also. So these are the various things that you have to understand. It is the anterior parametrium, which is a bilateral extension of the parametrium. And this is around the cervical vesical branches. And there you will always see the inferior vesical vein. So a good radical hysterectomy is visualizing inferior vesical vein. Now half the surgeons who are enrolled in their trial, I go to the place and I don't even think they know where the inferior vesical vein is. How can they ever clear the anterior parametrium? That is the most important thing. And I will just show you. I will just show you. Oops, this is not working. Uh, okay. So I will just take you. I don't know why this is. Uh, anyway. So I will just take you before that. Uh, is the This is the parametrium. These are the supports of the uterus. I will show you in the films. We'll just take it forward. We first published our technique way back in 2007. And at that point, Pedro still remains my friend. He questioned the timing. He questioned the timing in the editorial comments that it was less than 90 minutes. But then that doesn't matter. This technique was followed 258 patients, 48 patients initially published, then 510 patients. And later on, we can see this is 910. We have not randomized the data. But this is the latest publication that we have. I'm just going to take you through this publication, but you can see that our post-operative outcomes and complications were comparable to any of these internationally claimed area. We will not go into a single study because that's not a good thing to do uh, when you want to do this. And this is the, the, the parametrium which I would like to show you. Now, the posterior parametrium is very easily clear. It is this anterior parametrium. So the posterior parametrium consists of uterosacral, back and rods, and of course the paravaginal tissue. When you want to go to the anterior parametrium, you need to hold the uterine artery stump and slowly dissect the ureter away. You can see the nerve coming from below, but what is more important is the parametrium which is coming here. And as we dissect, you will see that the deep uterine veins have already been ligated and this is the anterior parametrium which needs to be cleared. So if that is the one, you can see the anterior cervical vesical ligament coming over there. That's the anterior cervical vesical ligament and then the posterior cervical vesical ligament. And this is more so when you do it for high volume tumors, which is more than two centimeters which is where the failures have taken place in this trial. When you have more than two centimeters tumor, if you do not dissect this complete tunnel and you do not see this vein, which you will see in a moment, then 
This is the inferior vesicle vein. If you don't see that vein, in that case, you are not doing a complete resection. Now, this is the dissection of the bladder. You will see that this is now, once this is done, we can do this. This is the cervical vesicle fascia. And this cervical vesicle fascia then splits into two on the either side and gets into this area. So you will see that in a moment. And this is the tunnel, what you call it as tunnel. Unless you clear this and dissect the ureter laterally and go down, the tumor is going to go downwards and downwards. You see the entire dissection. As you push the ureter away, you see there is a vein. This is the two superficial veins from the bladder, which always drain via the deep uterine vein. Have you seen a superficial bladder vein draining into the internal iliac vein? It doesn't exist. You need to know the anatomy. The deep, the deep one, there you can see, lower down, you will see the inferior vesicle vein coming up in a moment. The clip is on the deep uterine vein. And as we dissect this area, the reason, unfortunately, that I have to show you this is to make you understand what is a good radical hysterectomy. And that can remain as one of the basis of your area. This is the inferior vesicle vein which comes in the posterior cervical vesicle area and that goes into this area. So we will not go into this again. So again, you can see the inferior vesicle vein. Look at that. This is a deep uterine vein. The bladder, this is a superior vesicle artery on the top. This is the inferior vesicle vein. The inferior vesicle vein naturally carries the lymphatics along that area. And this is the amount of parametrium which should be looking during the surgery. If this is a parametrium, you do not take, and that's the final thing, and this is the complete uh, nest of the surgery. So now, our the second important thing is, when you want to avoid a vaginal spillage, there has been mentioned that they have taken man manipulators. Pedro said that this data is not important. This data is at most important. <laughs> yeah, no, you said that you didn't mention it. Because if you want to go back, so when you, you can't obviously go to the operation charts of every hospital and say whether the manipulators were used or not. The vaginal recurrences single-handedly are because you do not close the vaginal cup either from lower jaw or you don't close it from the top. And I will show you. This is the area which I went to Brazil and this is where the surgeon was operating. I don't use the ligature <coughs> here and you see that he's taking the vaginal cup, no closure from down, no closure from the top and spillage of the tumor <coughs> over there. And this is the basic reason when you want to close this that there is, if you do not close the vaginal cup, then there is the problem. So this is the author which says, that the authors concluded that the exposure of cervical cancers to carbon dioxide circulating may lead to result in this. This is the NCCN guidelines, which are 2019. What it says is that it doesn't tell you to abandon the laparoscopy. What it tells you is to use caution when you want to tell the patient. What this trial has done is making me look like a criminal. Now I get a patient whom I have operated in 2011, comes back with the local recurrence. This trial makes me guilty that this recurrence is because I did laparoscopy. This is the kind of impact this trial has made and this should not be like that. So this is the inclusion criteria. And if you see the inclusion criteria, the question that I asked Pedro, and I think he's going to get a rebirth for all this, were all the centers meeting this criteria, where everybody was completely trained, then, going to the data completeness, the trial was completely stopped, which he agrees because, so can you conclude with an incomplete data? Look at the various areas, the post-operative histology, positive in 11, in abdominal, and in 19, we have a positive parametrial margins. And in spite of 11 parametrial margins, which are positive in, in the open group, we still have more recurrences in the laparoscopic group. Now, this is unimaginable. I can't imagine this, which is there. And then the data is unknown in 20 to 30 cases. In a statistical analysis, when you don't know the patient and is lost to follow, either you don't include them or you say that the patients are dead. But this is not being done. While the margin status, positive or negative, was reported, none of this has been reported. The value, volume of the parametric tissue which is resected. The key for radical hysterectomy is parametrium, 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 and nothing else but parametrium. Nothing has been reported about the volume. 
both of which you can see of the surgeon's proficiency. And this was very cleverly put by Pedro. He just put few editorial comments saying that they questioned the proficiency. Of course, we'll question the proficiency. Of course, radicality is about the proficiency of the surgeon. Of course, the paper is about everything about the surgical outcomes. It is not about medical outcomes. It is about the surgical outcome. And we have right to question the proficiency of the surgeons. The higher incidence of local regional conferences in this MISR, which is expected even with, so is, does that mean that the MIS people did an incomplete and inadequate resection. This is one thing. Now, if you see, this is, I'm just repeating this. Side of recurrences, you can see 14 recurrences. You have got about 11 recurrences over here. Four in the ward and seven in the pelvis. What happened to these patients with the ward recurrences in the open? This is something which I have not found there. And then... 34 recurrences occurred, out of which 14 came from the 30th side. That means either they were very poor or the recurrences have come from the South American sites. They have not come from the other sites. Now, this is one question that he has to answer. The authors provide no details about the specific sites. What are those different sites where they were low volume sites or high volume sites? Look at the overall survival. There is a difference. Events which have taken place, only 3 in open and 19 in 319 patients. So the inability to declare the non-inferiority. So this trial <coughs> has shown better outcomes with open doesn't mean it is inferior to do laparoscopy. But for the moment, we have to organize this and say, well, the entire uh, total overall survival of 96% was much better then any of the trials which have been reported, none of the open surgery trials have reported more than 94% survival. And only LAC trial had the best surgeons doing open surgery with 96% overall survival at 5 years. Again, a little bit unacceptable, indicating that all these surgeons were excellent open surgeons because they gave you 96% survival and they were poor laparoscopic surgeons. That is something which is not done. And this is the disease survival specific rate. Finally, the authors observed that equivalent rates of post-operative complications. So the main virtue of minimal access surgery, what is the main virtue? What have we been trained on? That minimal access surgery decreases the morbidity of a procedure. But this entire trial shows the same morbidity. And you can look at that. It is this trial, post-operative complications, in, as 25% in MIS. Can we not again question the proficiency? Why are you telling us not to question the proficiency of the surgeon? The complication rate is very high. And look at this. The reason for conversion is almost laughable. Equipment not working. Look at that. Equipment not working. Non-visualization of the tumor. Unimaginable in today's era. When you are, the, you are participating in a trial, you should be having the best equipment. Ten patients have converted into open and you can see reasons are something which I do not understand. So conclusions, conclusions I think were drawn first, Pedro, my dear. I think you draw do the conclusions before you are the principal investigator who contributed only 20 patients of this entire trial. And then the article was written later. So I choose the people who will support my view. I don't choose the best people in the world. And then you can get this trial the same way. This is the responses. I don't want to question any of these things. I just want to question the ethnicity of the surgeon. I want to question their ability. I want to question their anatomical knowledge. And it is this radical spectrum. We do not come and again repeatedly say it's not about the surgeon's competence. It is about the surgeon's competence. Worldwide pancreatic surgery cannot be done if you don't do 25 surgeries per year. Esophageal surgery cannot be done if you are not doing 20 surgeries per year. But here you are allowed to do two surgeries accrue them and say that you are the best laparoscopic surgeon giving the best results again not acceptable so this is another trial which immediately got published the strengths of this trial pedro are excellent it's a prospective capture of adverse event robust trial disease multicentric international collaboration and what is important is limitation is that the number of robotic surgeries are less documentation of the adverse effects are higher then are clinically relevant. Now, what are the adverse events which are being located? Numbness, void squatting, vaginal laceration, bladder serosal tear, more emphasis on some adverse events which have no bearing in the final issue. So, LHCC trial 
was inconclusive. That's what I feel. And new procedure should be started. So the trial completeness is only 85%, which everybody has written in the editorial. There is a gray area of the extent of parametrium and vaginal margins to be removed. 631 patients, 33 centers, 14 centers with recurrences. That means the rest of the 19 centers were so good that there are no recurrences in MIS. Why don't you look at it the other way around? I can argue it from the other way around. So the 19 centers had the best surgeons, so no recurrences. And these 14 centers had bad surgeons. Why did you accept them for nine years? That's the question that I asked. So for nine years, you are blind to the things that these 14 centers are bad surgeons, bad surgery, recurrences are coming from there. You still wanted to continue because you had conclusions drawn before that this is a bad thing to do. And this is the area you can look at that. Look at India. One center which does Rajiv Gandhi Hospital, just an example in India and Delhi, which just does 20 radical hysterectomies a year. Why were the centers with high volumes not acceptable? Not even approached because that would have created problems. People with high volumes can do good surgery in MIS, but purposely this was not accepted. Uh, India center selected, Delhi, 20 radical hysterectomies. Our center, 150 radical hysterectomies. Five more centers doing more than 50. African centers, I can claim more and more. And this is where the things come. Only low volume centers selected. Again, conclusions written before, then the trial has been written. That is what is not there. Now, impact of hospital care on clinical outcomes. This is something which is what we have conveniently forgotten. And you want to say in a trial, you can accept two people, accepting two or three improvements. Because this is a trial, it is a medical jaggeron, it is about statistics. No, it is not. It is about clinical settings, it is about surgical technique, it is about doing good surgery. And this is, so after randomization, you have sometimes like two centers, how many cellular centers, surgical proficiency, was the classification adopted completely in all centers and only one third of the cases. Now he has projected only NCCN guidelines which say that this should be done with caution. NCCN guideline also says that no patient should be operated without MRI. One third of the patients were operated only on clinical staging with 25% and 25% FIGO staging which is clinically incorrect. FIGO says that. MRI has to be done. They have not done MRI. So incomplete. These are the participating centers. So questions is how were the patients distribution? Can we see the videos please? I have repeatedly written to the editor of the NEGM. No response. I select you. I only decide look at your videos. I say your videos are good because I am the investigator. I look at the videos. I say the radical step. Why don't you give it to independent organization? What is the surgical techniques used? What were the energy sources used? Did, was the, what was the classification system used? And 19 deaths which have been seen in open, uh, in, in the minimal access versus 3 in open. Look at this, total 22 deaths were noted, 19 in minimal invasive surgery, cause of death not mentioned. So we presume that 19 people in minimal invasive death, cancer died because of the cancer recurrences, but non-oncological deaths in MIS group and none in open. Is this the truth that open surgery is like the heaven? You do an open surgery, nobody dies. You do laparoscopic surgery, you are still ready to die after one year of myocardial infarct. So that's not the truth. Look at this. The same slide was projected by him. Look at the non-infinity brown D, 7.2%. This trial has not crossed the non-infinity boundary. And if it has not crossed the non-infinity boundary, the inference to this is this is an inferior trial. They themselves said that there should be 7.2% inferiority and they have not crossed this. Look at this P value. So it favors. So this is an overwhelming data, but is it randomized? And this is another drawback that tumors less than 2 centimeters, no lymphovascular invasion, no lymph node involvement. The trial was adequately not powered to do this. And 59 points, so 84% power is there. I think he has uh, written about this, so we should not go into this. And high performing open arm surgery, you can see 2% versus 10%. So use of manipulators. Again, I repeat that I have seen the same centers where I visit doing this vaginal opening, colpotomy without using any kind of protection. And that may be one of the reasons, but I don't want to jump to this conclusion. The truth remains, apparent low participation in the countries where MIS is the surgery of choice. 
Subgroup analysis is needed. And one more thing he has quoted today is the American data that the cervical cancer is going down. Exactly, it is going down in the Western country. It is going down in the United States. Unfortunately, those are the people are now going to tell the rest of the world where the cervical cancer is still existing that don't do it minimal excessive because though our numbers are less, we are better people to conclude for you. It is not done. So this is not the truth. The trial should be restarted with this. And this is what, so only 15.6% were taken. I don't think I should comment on robotic there, though I also did robotic initially, but robotic is not a good thing. So if you accept the trial, all competent surgeons perform a radical hysterectomy. All were equally competent in laparoscopic surgeon as open. I have seen excellent open surgeons not doing good laparoscopy. I have seen excellent laparoscopic surgeons not able to understand open. Now, why do you possibly have done good surgery in open? Is when you come to the anterior parametrium with your finger, you push the ureter away like this, like this. And then just put a clamp like that. So probably the anterior parametrium unknowingly gets removed in open while in laparoscopic surgery you can't put your finger and push the ureter and palpate and that's where the clearance of the anterior parametrium fails into this look at the technical nuisances you can see there were participating surgeons who had not completed fellowship in dining oncology there were others who were general surgical with surgical oncology fellowships and none of them had published from these 14 centers, any article on radical hysterectomy. I select a novice, tell him to do a radical hysterectomy. I want 33 centers, involve them. That's the best part. And this, so this is, in this study, recurrence rates among patients who had received the Rotman study, which was published immediately. So parametral measurements should be used as an objective data. And this is what I should feel that the, though the trial is good, the intent was good, it is not the ultimate truth that we are facing. So we all recognize that the learning curve is the most important thing. Majority of the trials, majority of the laparoscopic procedures say that there should be learning curve. We don't even know what is the criteria of each surgeon, whether type 2 and type 3 radical hysterectomies were done. And if you see, they, they have quoted that only type 3 radicality was seen in the videos. Type 2 or the so surgical proficiency, it may explain. What you can read this very, very clearly, exception of parametrial measurements were similar, number of positive nodes were similar, then why were the recurrences more in the MIS group? This is so we don't know whether the number of patients entered, whether the wrong type of radical hysterectomy was performed for tumors more than two centimeter. If the patient, if the surgeon has performed a type 2 radical hysterectomy or type C1, then it's not a good thing to do. The exact location of these. Recurrences, peritoneal, lymph nodes, port size, and the methods used to avoid spread during the surgery, like early closure of vagina and others, still remain unanswered. So it is obvious that this issue cannot be settled till another trial is done. Single pathologist review, preoperative MRI for all patients, parametral measurement, and unified criteria for type 2 and type 3. Gynae oncologists with subspeciality board certification or published results are the right people to do this and the adequacy of this which you can see in the videos was only of type 3 and did each of the four members review each of the videos and was there an unanimous agreement that Pedro will of course tell us whether all the four reviewers said the radical hysterectomy was great by the surgeon who presented this. How many videos were submitted but not accepted? Did you send that the video saying that this is not a good radical hysterectomy? Even on a given day, the best surgeon sometimes does not perform the best surgery. So it seems that 678 surgeries which were performed out of which 320 radical MIS were always perfect on any given day the patient was random. This is something which is not acceptable and the higher rate of ward recurrences in open group in the other. So this is the evidence based publications in favor of MIS. You have whenever you want to do any debate, you have editors bias, publishers bias, authors bias. I have a bias to choose the articles which support me and here are the multiples of them which choose and which show that this is much better to do it laparoscopically. So it's very easy to find these on the left. It's not difficult. But comparison of laparoscopic versus this, and you can see. So international publications, you can see in favor of laparoscopy, 
total laparoscopic versus uh, this is the observational study then success factors in nerve sparing radical hysterectomy laparoscopic robotic a systematic review where everybody has said that laparoscopy is good you can see this so time to establish the non inferiority of minimal invasive i'm not here to say open is bad i'm just here to say that all these our efforts of 16 years to popularize these spaces to popularize what is parametrium to popularize how minimal invasive surgery is better for the patient one single paper cannot destroy the efforts of so many surgeons worldwide who are trying to do a parametrial revolution and understanding the anatomy so i think ramina sir you are going back to being ancient i'm new so i hope and this is what is so i think pedro is the only exercise that he does is he excels at jumping at the conclusion i jump i come back i retrieve i look back what i am doing and then this is as quickly as the opportunities you get so evolution of the surgery cannot be halted for the good of mankind progress is impossible without change yes change is needed change is constant but those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything his mind is already fixed with open what i do i do standing here for half an hour things are not going to change thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you